Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to another Critique of the Week. Thanks so much for joining me. Um, as always, the critique is the point is to give that workshop experience. It's so valuable letting uh, folks know what strangers think about their poems. Um, you know, we have hundreds or so submissions in the queue. If you'd like to submit, all you do is go to rattle.com slash critique. Actually, let me show you that on screen. Why not? So if, you, uh, if you'd like to share um, poems for the critique, all you have to do is go to rattle.com slash uh, critique, and that will take you to uh, this page right here. Uh, you go to content. Um, it's kind of short, small here, but there you go to uh, critique of the week. And then that takes you to this page, which, uh, oops, hang on a second. Take you to this page where it has the details about what we do here. You click to submit. All you do is send two poems, and uh, you can have your poems discussed by our group of wonderful poets. We have so many great poets here. We're all here to try to help everyone get better. And if you'd like to get better, too, or know, you know why your poems aren't getting accepted and published, maybe that's something you want to know, um, feel free to click here to submit two poems for the critique. These poems aren't being submitted for publication. They're just being submitted to be discussed on this show every Friday afternoon at 4 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we have a great group of poets that are uh, always wonderful sharing their thoughts. And, um, and uh, you can have their thoughts <laughs> at your disposal, too. So let's see who do we have. Cindy Gunther is here, James Langford. Uh, Brian O'Sullivan, Dick Westheimer's here, Monica Dobos, Clayton Clark is here, um, let's see, D. Coleman, Mary Keating, Sharon Ferrante, Matt T.C., Steve Harrell, Nate Jacob, Katie Dozier in the other room, uh, Morgan Feeney's here, Deb T., yeah, we got a great crowd, Elizabeth Wolf is here, uh, Gary Rosin, Mark Grinier, yeah, so great crew over on youtube facebook always slighter than it used to be but we have tara meselik mcmahon we got nate jacob dubbing, doing double duty we got margaret doyle too so we got a few people over there on facebook we're streaming on x as well if you're watching on x and you want to participate um come over to youtube so you can leave chat messages so i can see your thoughts um, um leave as many thoughts as you would in the chat windows on facebook and youtube uh, over on x though you can just watch but if you want to watch that's great too Okay, so I thought we'd start out, it's nice to do, we're going to do a um, quick run through the oldest poems, which we actually did last week. I just want to do more of these so we can get caught up, because I think it is more useful if we're talking about poems that are more fresh in the poet's mind. And I think that's a, that's a valid point, point. and I think if we can get caught up, we're up to April, um, poems submitted in April, so I think we're going to move through as many as we can. But first I thought we'd do a little, uh, little lesson in poetry, and this one is um, today's poem I thought we'd take a look at. This is uh, today's poem from Rattle is a leaf removal by Al Ortolani. And leaf removal is actually, we nominate it for a Pushcart Prize. Um, what Basically, how the Pushcart Prize works is every press gets six nominations. And what we tend to do is kind of like my favorite poem and Alan's favorite poem, Megan's favorite poem. And then I pick like three. We kind of talk about the three that are just the best in addition to that. And um, so we can kind of have some personal taste there. We just happen to like something. Um, or, you know, we're looking for the poems that are the best and most memorable that we publish all year. So you get six. It's, it's sort of like the best poems you publish all year, but there's a lot of components that go into it. And, um, and this was Alan's favorite poem this year, actually. It was, we looked through the poems. He loved this poem. And, um, and, and I think, um, you can see why the emotion that this poem brings about. Let's let, let's let, uh, Al Orlani read it. And then we'll talk about the poem a little bit. What I want to talk about though is um, the sort of the structure of a poem, um, the way a poem is paced and how it how the turn happens and how the poem goes somewhere. So we're going to talk about that, but let's take a look at the poem first and think about that as we go, because uh, that's what we're going to be talking about today is a little micro lesson. So here we go with uh, Al Ortolani reading his own poem, Leaf Removal. Leaf Removal. I listened to my wife on the phone explaining to Leaf Removal, Inc., how we just can't pick up the leaves anymore. It's getting to that point she says that we need someone, which really isn't true because we could slide down the hill on our heels, rake the leaves into piles, douse them with charcoal lighter, and set them ablaze. Then we just need a metal tined rake to lean on, a little luck to keep the house from going up in flames. And with the garden hose uncoiled, nozzle dribbling like a mouth, watch last year turn to smoke, a slip, an ass tumble. Instead, two rabbits leap out of the leaves, zigzagging ahead of the dog, 
who forever believes he's a hunter with sharp white teeth and the speed to stay stride for stride with the memory of himself. Yeah, and so once again, that was uh, Al Ortolani with uh, Leaf Removal. And Al was, um, is it up here? Is it a go-to? Al was the, um, at the, hang on a second, we'll, we'll show you this too. Well, let me fix this. So Al was the uh, author of this chapbook too. Um, he's a teacher in, um, is it Nebraska or Iowa? Um, somewhere like that. But he's the po- author of uh, Hansel and Gretel, Get the Word on the Street. Um, that chat book from the uh, 2000, what was it, 2018 Rattle Chat Book Prize winner, maybe Hansel and Gretel Get the Word on the Street about teaching and, and you know, a lot of stories from his time as a, as a school teacher. Um, anyway, great chat book and a great poet and uh, always one of our favorite. And for, so for this poem, um, it, it sort of strikes me as a really basic structure for a poem, which is the sonnet structure. And so we sort of set up um, with the first chunk what's going on in the poem. And then we take a turn, which in the sonnet is the volta. Um, but here it's a turn into um, sort of turning into the metaphor. But let's see how it works. So leaf removal is the title of the poem. And, um, and, and you can see already, you can imagine what sort of puns are going on or what, um, what metaphors are going on there with leaf removal. Um, but I listened to my wife on the phone explain to leaf removal ink how we just can't pick up the leaves anymore. So we really easily, quickly establish the situation. Um, there's sort of the setup here. Um, you know, I'm calling, you know, with my wife. So you have the two people, you know, the subjects of the poems. Um, and, and we can't pick up the leaves anymore. So you know that the sort of age and you get the whole idea of the whole scenario going on. Um, leaf removal ink is probably not, I imagine. I, I bet this happened. I bet it's based on a true story. Um, you know, where Al was thinking about having his leaves removed maybe for the first time instead of raking them. And I bet it wasn't leaf removal ink, but he called it leaf removal ink so he could get away with just dropping that in or so you know what it's about. Um, and so uh, so he puts in, or maybe it is actually the, the name of the place. But either way, we know all the, in these one first sentence, we know exactly what's going on. We know the who, what, why, where, when. You know, we know it's their, you know, house, you know, the husband and wife. You know, they're getting older. You know, they're getting their leaves removed. And the whole poem is set up right off the bat. It's getting to that point, she says, that we need someone which really isn't true because we could slide down the hill. And so so it goes into this imaginary space. So she says it's getting to that point. Uh, she says that we need someone uh, which really isn't true because we could slide down the hill on our heels, rake the leaves in the piles, douse them with charcoal lighter, and set them ablaze. And so, uh, and so, so you get these really, you know, strong details, these sort of concrete images um, of, you know, which is just a sort of a flight of fancy as you're thinking about these leaves being removed, what you could do, what you would have to do to be able to rake the leaves at this point. And, um, and, and so there's a bit of humor in that too. Um, then we just need a metal tined rake to lean on, a little luck to keep the house from going up in flames and with a garden hose uncoiled, nozzle dribbling like a mouth so nice little metaphor there too. It, just this whole vivid scene of what he's imagining how it would go if you had the leaves removed. Um, Watch last year turn to smoke, a slip, an ass tumble. But then you get this instead, which signifies where the poem's going to take a turn. Uh, you know, you're going from this phone call, imaginary space, and then instead to what actually happens um, immediately after this is going on. Instead, two rabbits leap out of the leaves, zigzagging ahead of the dog, who forever believes he's a hunter, the sharp white teeth and the speed to stay stride for stride with the memory of himself. And that great metaphor and that beautiful image at the very end, which is what really sings the whole poem home. Um, and so you have this structure where we set up the sort of the problem, the situation, we, we imagine it, we make it really vivid, a scene, then we turn into a, a different action, which is sort of unexpected which is the, do- the rabbits leaping out and the dog zigzagging ahead. And then the dog becomes a metaphor um, for aging. And, and, you know, not even a metaphor, a symbol, because um, the dog is aging too. And, um, and then you get this beautiful line too, the speed to stay stride for stride. And it's not with itself, it's with the memory of himself. And of course, that parallels uh, what the subjects, the two characters in the poem are dealing with, of, of sort of having to admit that you're not, you know, young enough to rake your own leaves anymore. 
And so with a really simple structure, that sense of movement, you get a poem that's really powerful. And there's really not a lot complicated going on here. I mean, the only thing that's sort of a brilliant um, image or something really unexpected or unusual is this image at the very end of um, the dog stride for stride with a memory of itself. Um, and you can see, too, probably how the poem develops um, is Al, you know, has a sense. He watches, you know, he has to have the leaves raked. His wife's probably actually there on the phone. And he's thinking he has a feeling that comes across with having to call um, leaf removal instead of rake the leaves. And then, you know, what is that feeling? You know, let me explore that a little bit is what's going on. So Al sits down to write the poem, starts describing the scene, um, starts describing his imagination where the lighter and, you know, burning it comes and <laughs> scooting down the hill. And um, and then this image pops out and said, maybe this happened really, or maybe it was something in the process of writing through the poem that the image appeared of the dog. But then the dog becoming a metaphor for his feeling was what the subconscious was trying to tell Al the whole time. And so I thought this is a really great example of a structure of how a poem she operates it like the, um, the most basic kind of poem. And you can make a brilliant poem writing the most basic poem, setting up a scene, letting us see the story, finding the, 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 the me deeper meaning in that scene that you allowed your subconscious to pull up and sort of play with for a while. And that's really, you know, and that's the exact structure and about the same length because it has shorter lines as a sonnet. You know, a sonnet has, um, you know, the first eight lines and then the volta and then the last concluding six usually in, the, in that structure. And it's because it's a structure that really works. And you can see that structure in a lot of poems. It's not just Al's. It just happened to be the poem of the day, and I thought we'd point it out. Um, but a really interesting poem and a good way to just look at it. So if you had, um, you know, when you talk about a poem that doesn't go anywhere, where I mean, a poem needs something more, open another door or find another place to go, um, surprise us, find out where you're going to surprise yourself, that happens so much with poems. Um, what we're talking about is going to a place like this instead, where all of a sudden two rabbits leap out of the leaves. Um, and then zigzag ahead of the dog, and then the dog can become the metaphor. And there's, it's that, that sort of, you have the one space that you've created, and then you go into another space. That's what we're always talking about. It's a great example of that, and a really simple poem, but a beautiful poem that was really moving to Alan, and um, enough that he wanted to pick it as the uh, Pushcart Prize nominee for this year. So, um, and thanks as always to Al for sending us his great poems. Really like that guy a lot. Anyway, okay, so that is a quick lesson in in sort of pacing and, and plot arc of poetry. Let's go on to the um, actual poems now. And what happened here? Let me refresh this. Okay. So we're going to look at uh, Pointless first. This is a poem came in from Anna Broughtwood, Anna Botwood uh, from New York, and uh, back in April 2022. So let's take a peek at this poem. Yeah. Oh, let, me, let me read a little little comments about Al's poem, too. So Monica Doba says, I like how the rabbits and the dogs symbolize life as opposed to their decline. Yeah, that's a great way to put it, too. And Mark Henry says, nice tone control with a little bit of humor that keeps it away from self-pity, too. Yep, yep, that's a great point. Yeah, it's, there's a lot to like in that little poem. It seems simple, but there are a lot of poetic tools going on. And Al is somebody who's been writing poems for a long time. Um, he was an English teacher, and, you know, he's always been a great poet. So, um, yeah. So, here we go. This is, um, then we're going to go to the next poem. This is Pointless. There was no questions from um, the poet who is Anna Botwood. So here, let's just take a dive into the poem. Here we go. Pointless. Let me get some distractions out of the way. Okay. Pointless. Um, Sister Rosemary taught us. When you point a finger at someone, there are three fingers pointing back at you. Sometimes I turn it over in my mind. Sometimes I think there isn't much to tell. He learned from the best, a prominent male feminist, later me too into obscurity. Let me sit atop this secret and never point the finger, because I've always believed, inevitably, they tell on themselves. Um, so that was a poem, Pointless, by... Um, by, uh, once again, it was uh, Anna Botwood. And so I was really engaged with this poem um, early on. So so at the beginning, Pointless, we, it's a, it's one of those titles that tells you sort of the direction something's going to go. 
um, without really saying much else. But it's enough to make you a little bit curious. So, you you know, if you say pointless, then your immediate thought is what's pointless. So that's, it does something. It makes you a little bit curious to read the first line. Sister Rosemary taught us when you point a finger at someone, there are three fingers pointing back at you. And I think that was the great first line. Um, you know, Rosemary taught us, and I'm wondering. So one of the things you're doing is drawing curiosity um, and, um, and, and making someone want to read your poem. And the first few lines do this really well. And when you point the finger at someone, there are three fingers pointing it back at you. And it's so a really simple, nice use of um, just regular speech. And you can see how regular speech is engaging right here. Sometimes I turn it over in my mind. Sometimes I think there isn't that much to tell. And so, um, and so I liked it up to here. And I'm not sure why there's not a period at the end of this uh, line, too. <laughs> um, yeah, so there should be a period here. And I like the pacing and the use of the regular voice. But then he learned from the best, a prominent male feminist, later me too into obscurity. To me, I think it loses the thread a little bit with how abstract it is. Um, he learned from the best, a prominent male feminist, later me too into obscurity. Part of the thing is, I don't know who... So is he the... If he learned from the best, is he learning from the prominent male feminist? And who was the feminist, male feminist, me too into obscurity, or was the he? So I get a little confused by the lack of detail about who's speaking. Um, yeah, as Mary Picot says, who is he? Are we with Sister Rosemary? Um, yeah, let me sit atop the secret and never point the finger. So somebody obviously, um, you know, sexually assaulted, um, you know, the speaker of the poem here. Um, so we know that's what it is, but it's a little too, the, the distance here and the lack of revealing, it makes it kind of hard to follow and you lose a lot of the emotional connection because of that. Um, yeah. Um, let me sit atop the secret, but never point the finger. And so this goes back to the kind of sort of direct pacing and sort of speech register as these lines here, which I think we're working um, because I've always believed inevitably they tell on themselves. And I think the conclusion isn't really satisfying either. Um, yeah, so Nate Jacobs says, once it turns to the he, the narrative is lost in vague storytelling. I'd love to have this all fleshed out more. There is a point to telling the whole story. Um, Carolina Carolina says, I think he is the male feminist, and she's calling him out. Yeah, I, I think just the syntax is ambiguous here. So did he, is it someone who was a student of the male feminist or not? And I don't even know how much it matters. And and why are we being given details that don't matter? Um, I think that the, um, like if, if the poem, if, if the poem stayed vague without having any kind of details, it might even work. Um, you know, if it was like, sometimes I think there isn't that much to tell. Um, let me sit atop the secret and never point the finger. And then all the implications for that sort of get your mind racing and and maybe with that it might work as a as a you know a rare poem that that ends up working pretty well in from a vague position um but adding these details sort of make you want to know more but they're so obscure and vague that you can't really get anything from it and so it's just sort of does nothing it just leaves you there and then the end doesn't feel satisfying to me because i've always believed inevitably they tell on themselves doesn't feel like it follows from the emotional um the emotional position of um, the opening of the poem. Because you can feel this sort of, a poem always, as we saw from um, from El Orlani's poem already, a poem starts with some kind of unsettled feeling where it's unsettled, not necessarily in a good or bad way. Um, a lot of times if you're unsettled, it's about something bad, but it doesn't have to be. But um, they're just unsettled. It, it's not organized yet. That's that sort of sense of unsettled. There's this thing that's like nodding us. We don't quite understand. And that's why we start writing a poem. In Al's, it was that phone call having to do the leaf removal. In here, it's that idea of, um, you know, pointing the finger at someone is pointing three fingers back at you. Is that good advice or not? Was that bad advice from Sister Rosemary? Um, you know, and, and there's a way that it's sort of both. And, and that, that sort of gnawing at you issue is what really is the heart of the poem. And then the poem doesn't really dive into that subject. It just sort of um, went on to being what it was or, you know, where it went. And it doesn't feel satisfying to me. Yeah. Mary Keating says the ending is so milk-a-toast. 
especially if she was sexually assaulted, to remove from motion. Yeah, and so it sort of has to decide what it wants to do and then actually explore what it's doing. So I think that the kernel of the poem is very genuine here. There's a lot of emotion behind it, but then it didn't dive into what it wanted to be. Um, yeah. And so Cindy Guntherman says maybe she wants him to be called out but is scared to be involved. Yeah, I mean, there's all those emotions swirling within this. And two... Uh, really, that idea of, of Sister Rosemary saying that it's like the noble thing to not point a finger at somebody when you know it's not in a lot of cases. And that contradiction is really like the what's emotionally resonant about the poem, but that's not explored in the second half. Um, so, yeah. And, and so I, I just think the poem is not resolved and it needs to be pushed. You've you got to push farther into it to, to turn it into a really effective poem because there's something there behind the surface, obviously. Um, another poet says, this is a good question. In 30 years, will anyone know what me too means? Also confused by the who, but yeah, we talked about that. But, um, but the me, yeah, I mean, that's a question too. How, how fixed in time do you want your poem to be? I mean, in 2000 years, no one will be able to read because English will have evolved so much if we're still here speaking English at all. Um, so there's a time frame for every poem. Um, is, is a reference like me too, something that's going to be you know, relevant and people are going to know, or is it going to be obscure reference that only people with, uh, you know, detailed knowledge of this decade <laughs> will have? I'm not, you know, and I'm not sure the answer to that, but it is something to think about. Um, and how long do you want your poem to be able to live? Um, let's see. Mark Greenish says, I like the use of me too here, an original way to say an idea or an opinion grown old. Um, yeah. Nate Jacobs says too, it's too much irony to tell me it's pointless to tell me what you ever get around to tell me though you are indeed telling me that there is something. What is the point of that? This poem? Yeah. Well, to me, I'm just saying the point of the poem is this, um, is the mixed message in here in, in that, you know, and so that Sister Rosemary had a point, and also she had a terrible point at the same time. And, and how to resolve that is, seems to me the question that's sort of gnawing at the, the poet here, and I think needs to be resolved and, and fleshed out more. Okay, let's move on to another poem. And next we will go to... Uh, this poet is um, Anjali Pandey uh, from India. Um, it's called Dying Poet, No Specific Questions, so here we go. An Elegy for Love, and it's two poems too, and also Yet Fortunate. So let's take a look at An Elegy for Love. An Elegy for Love. I complained and lost thee, my beloved portal to oxytocin. I have always adored you, never really meant the words I said out of complex emotions. You looked inside of me when I was most vulnerable. If you may have judged me, just keep it to yourself. As lovely as it was, I wouldn't have minded dying in your arms. A portal to my enemy you saw. What you shouldn't have, but fate was written. Goodbyes were due, and we skipped them from the love of summer. Oh, summers, summers in your arms. Lovely, lovely sleep I had. Evening breeze so welcoming to my face. I have never felt like this anywhere. No wander lost to see the old world. I could have died happily in your arms. Where to go? Oh, come and tell me. Your eternity, endless, boundless love of physicists. Possibilities to find answers, fulfill their chest with pride in it. Where should I go now? I write to you, but you will never read it. Summer was when you adored me as much as I adored you. Mozart makes me weep silently as I write to you endlessly. If you're Keats, then I'm your Fanny. Fate was written, so I was left without you, my honey. Um, so this, to me, um, feels like a poem that, that that's more personal and doesn't really um, let us in as much um, to be a kind of a public poem that we can really feel a lot to. It feels really directly addressed to the you, um, in a way that I, um, I don't really feel connected to it. It feels very intimate and, and private um, between two people. And um, there are some interesting lines, though, that I like a lot. So I like, I love, I complained and lost thee, my beloved portal to oxytocin. Like the combination of the archaic thee with the oxytocin is kind of a nice start. I, I kind of enjoyed that. 
Um, um, but then lines like this, I have always adored you. Um, you know, I don't really, I don't have an emotional connection to that. And if I was the one adored me, I would. Um, but, uh, but, you know, as an abstraction to somebody that I don't know, can't see, don't have any connection to, you have to build that connection so that we can feel the feeling too. Um, and that's what I mean by it's too personal. It's too intimate. It doesn't let us, the reader outside into it. Um, if you look at love poems by Keats and things like that, you can feel who the person you're talking to is. Um, yeah. Um, Nate Jacob says this, this poem deserves to be rewritten as a guzzle, as a way of making formal and, and rhythmic the longing. That's a good point. It would work really well as a guzzle based on the topic. Just want some details, um, something concrete to hold on to and, and get a sense of what's actually going on. Um, and who the people are, and so I can actually feel, because you have to sort of be able to imagine something before you can feel it. Um, yeah, as Katie Dorter says about being able to feel the specific connection relationship, it feels melodramatic, also partly due to the diction like portal, weeping, etc. Yeah, that's true. So, um, anyway, as lovely as it was, I wouldn't have minded dying in your arms. So it's kind of cliche, and the kind of thing where if it was... If it's a love letter written to somebody and you give it to them, it's very functional and successful. It works. Um, but as a third party watching, observing this, like what we are as readers of books and magazines and stuff, um, we just can't connect. A portal to my enemy, you saw what you shouldn't have, but fate was written. Goodbyes were due. We skipped them for the love of summer. I like f for the love of summer. I like when that repeats. And um, Nate Jacobs said maybe a guzzle would be a good idea. Having that love of summer is the sort of the whatever that word is for the last re for the refrain part of the guzzle, I think is a good suggestion. I think you could use that. Um, summers in your arms, lovely, lovely sleep. I had evening breeze. So well, putting my face, we have like evening breeze. We just have all this abstraction and there's nothing really tangible to hold on to that. We get a real vivid sense of who we're, who we're confronting here. Um, let's see. I've never felt like this anywhere. No wander lust to see the world. I could have died happily in your arms. Where to go? Oh, come and tell me. Your eternally endless, boundless love of physicist. I'm not sure that that's sort of awkward. I mean, should it be physics? Um, or love of a physicist? And, and then why a physicist? I'm a little, I don't follow that. Um, possibilities to find answers, fulfill their chest with pride in it. Where should I go now? I write to you, but will you ever read it? I like this notion now. I write to you, but you will ever, never read it. Uh, I think that's a line that has a little bit more resonance and you can sort of imagine, you start to feel it a little bit right there. Um, and then the next line too is nice. Summer was when you adored me as much as I adored you. Uh, you know, those combinations, I think that works a little bit. So I think that's maybe the heart of the poem that could be brought out. Um, and then too, is like Brian O'Sullivan says here, you know, because there was this playing with this contrast of the, the, with the very scientific word, um, the love hormone, um, if you're going to do that there, it should be done elsewhere. So Brian says, um, I agree that the ye in the beginning is funny, but I think that they should either do more or less of that kind of archaic language throughout the poem. Yeah, exactly. It's got to be either, you know, it's a, there's this uncanny valley between doing it a lot so it's really prominent and a good joke kind of and not doing it enough where it's, um, um, or not doing it at all, where it's not something that gets in the way, but with a little bit it becomes distracting. So it's inconsistent. Um Let's see. Yeah, Mary King says, many poems we critique are obscure. There must be an idea floating around for newbie poets that vagueness is poetic when the opposite is true. Exactly, which is one of the things, if you've been watching this for years, I try to explain over and over and over again that emotions live in specificity. That, you know, there's a sense that I don't think it's, um, it's not anything anybody told anybody, but there's a sense that if I'm vague, if I, if I, I'm not, if I'm sort of generalized, then more people will be able to relate to it. And that's just not exactly at all how writing or any kind of creative media works. Um, having, you know, idiosyncratic, interesting, unusual, distinct, concrete things going on, make the more unique you get the thing, the more we connect to it. Because it's, in, we're, we're letting something when we're reading a poem, we're letting it, letting that voice enter our body and we become that and so we have a lot more empathy um, and a lot more feeling the more we can make that connection the more something that enters you that feels really concrete and discreet and unique um, that way we can just have a more connection to it in that process so we want the more powerful poems are the more 
um, detailed and specific, not vague in general. But there's this sort of general feeling that um, that if I'm if I'm more general, more people will be able to relate, and that's just the opposite of how it works. Um, okay. Now let's take a look at the other poem too, and, and we'll see just if it has the same issues or not. Yet fortunate. Who listens to me when I cry for mercy, shut me every time, locked me behind? There is empathy between the two of us who cries for the same misery. Connected, we connect without words. Just an expression is enough. Never shared a single word, yet so connected. The crave for social acceptance made two of us the same. The, see, I'm just going to stop right there because it's the same thing. We don't have any sense of who the you is. Um... You know, we have to have a concrete, something concrete and tangible to hold on to. We have to see this actual person or else it's just this private poem that can work if you're giving it to the person um, you want to share it with, uh, but doesn't work when a stranger reads it. Because why should we care about who the you is when we don't even know who the you is or can't see it or feel that you? Um, So anyway, so we're going to move on to the next poem. Thanks for sharing those. We're trying to be quick here so we get through a good number. But once again, that was um, Anjali Pandey. And um, let's go on to the next poet. And next up we have, um, this is um, Radoslav Stoyanov. I, I remember saying that name before. I think we've had uh, Radoslav's poems before at some point from Vienna. Um, so here's Radoslav. Savage people. Here we go. And there's no questions about it. Just um, take a look. Savage people. When I saw your sunny eyes, completely dried, ran out of tears. When I faced the wall of ice you built because of all the fears. When I touched your bleeding soul, collapsing into a thousand pieces, I had to see and got to know the reason why you were so fierce. Deceptive oaths by vicious friends, omitted pledges, many cheatings, have left for you the toxic yields of endless lies and poisoned feelings. Corrupted minds pollute the hearts of all the people left on living between the worn out faulty parts of wasted fate without forgiving. Savage people rule the day. They sell no dreams, no hope, no future. You must hide your love away or throw it down to feed the vultures. So, as you know, I like rhyming poems. So there's a nice rhythm to it, there's a nice use of enjambment. Uh, where some of the lines don't end, stop at the end, but rather flow to the next line. So you have a, even within the rhythm and the rhyme, there's a variety. And so you never get bored with it. It never becomes tedious and sing-song-like. It, it keeps um, a nice rhythm. But again, um, we get the po- a poem that is, is too vague to, to really connect with, again, because of that you. Um, and even when I started with um, uh, being the editor of Rattle, 20 years ago, and like literally 20 years ago, I remember it was 20 years old of the day, maybe, talking to um, Stella Sue Lee, the original poetry editor of Rattle, she would t- she talked to me about how much she hates you poems, she would call them, and it's because you is a way to be really, really vague. We don't know who the you is, and it's a way to distance yourself as a, as a writer uh, from the subject so that you sort of have this, you know, the safety of distance. Um, and, but then what ends up happening is we don't really connect with the you, and so we don't know, we don't really connect with the poem. And this is the same kind of thing here where we don't really get to see who the you is. Um, and, you know, if you go back, if just flip back really quick to leaf removal. Um, I listened to my wife on the phone explaining leaf removal, ink, explain to leaf removal, ink, how he can't just can't pick up the leaves anymore. So right there, you get so much detail. You get that it's my wife. You get that it's leaf removal, ink. Um, you get on the phone. So you have this whole little scene and you, you know, and we can't pick up the leaves anymore. You get the whole story in one sentence in detail. And that's really what's missing in so many poems. Um, let's see. But so this is Savage People. They're, um, Tom Barlow says the erratic blend of exact and slant rhyme distract me. I I don't mind that. I like it. I mean, some of the lines are weak or the rhymes are weak though, which is a problem. Um, yeah. And, and Morgan Phoenix says the rhymes feel a bit forced in places. Um, but Dick Fastheimer, you know, said what I did good in jam in here makes the rhyming form feel readable. So let's, let's take a look at a little more detail, though. So we want more specific details within the poem, more concrete details. We'll just say that and let that go. Um, when I saw your sunny eyes, see sunny eyes. I mean, it's a little bit of a detail, but it's not much. Completely dried, ran out of tears. 
Um, you know, running out of tears is a bit cliche. When I fi face the wall of ice you built, and, and what's the wall of ice? Like it's an abstraction, but we don't have any anything concrete yet. So there's nothing to like abstract from. Um, and so we're sort of like hovering in space. There's sunny eyes, all of a sudden there's ice. Uh, because of all the fears and the tears and fears rhyme is really trite. It's a very common rhyme with sort of melodramatic words. Um, so it's got to do better there. The eyes and ice are nice. There's a slant rhyme to it, aspect to it too, uh, which is nice. When I touch your bleeding soul, so there's like more melodrama with the tears, the fears, the bleeding soul. I mean, really the truth is um, if you submit a poem to a literary magazine and uh, and you see tears, fears, and bleeding soul within the first five lines, uh, the, the odds of that poem being published really flatline. Um, you know, that kind of melodrama just doesn't hold up. You have to sort of establish emotion. You can't just sort of force emotion out of people by saying a soul is bleeding. Um, it, we don't connect to that. So um, collapsing into a thousand pieces, I had to see and got to know the reasons why you were so fierce. And there are the pieces and fierce, which is a nice slant rhyme there. Um, and I, I like the um, unpredictability of the rhyme when it appears like that. And the enjambment right there is nice too. So that's a nice rhythmic stanza. Um, let's see. D deceptive oaths by vicious friends. So what are the deceptive oaths? I mean, this is what I'm talking about. You know, it, if we go back to, again, El Ortolani, um, you know, my wife talked to someone and was sad. <laughs> I mean, like the difference between that and my wife was calling on the phone and asking about how the leaf, to get the leaves removed is so different than, um, it is so much more detail than deceptive oaths by vicious friends, omitted pledges. Like, what are the oaths? What are the cheatings? Like, what's actually going on? We don't get to know. Um, okay. Um, have left you for the toxic yields of endless lies and poison feelings. Um, you know, it, it's just such generalized that um, it, it means nothing to me. And it needs to, it needs to have specific details so we can know what's actually going on. Um, okay. Corrupted minds pollute the hearts of all the people left on living between the worn out faulty parts of wasted fate without forgiving. I like the, I really love the rhythm here of this though. There's really nice, the, it's true rhyme here, but they, they sound nice and it, there's a good meter, a good rhythm to it. Corrupted minds pollute the hearts of all the people left on living between the worn out faulty parts of wasted fate without forgiving. The enjambment is just beautiful there. Um, so it's just, is music. It's really nice. Savage people rule the day. And so, so we get, you know, the poem is called Savage People. You know, we're sad and afraid and the soul is bleeding because of savage people and the savage people rule the day. So the poem doesn't really go anywhere either. So you want to know what's actually happening and, and we want to know, we want to go somewhere, uh, make some kind of turn. Um, they sell no dreams, no hope, no future. You must hide your love away or throw it down to feed the vultures. I like the future in vultures. There's aspects of this poem I like. It's just, it just held at such arm's length that I can't really feel anything from it. Okay, let's, is that the only one or there two? That's it. Let's move on. Thanks for sharing that again. That was on Radislav Stoyanov with Savage People. Okay. Let's go next to um, go. Let's go next to another poet. And next up we have Oh, Matt TC says 2018. Did, was that said that on the poem? Was that in the bottom? I noticed some stuff. Yeah, so the poem was written on the bottom. Yeah, yeah, 24 6, 2018. So this poem is, even though it was submitted last spring, it was written five years before that. Um, all right. Well, anyway, that was an interesting note. Glad you picked that up, Matt. Uh, okay. Next up, we have Aaron Sickler from uh, New York. And Aaron has a question. Um, Aaron asks, um, what is the tone of each poem? Flow, does it work? Second poem needs further compression. Um, do you know the subject of the poem? Does it matter? Well, probably it does matter, but we'll see. <laughs> okay, so this is uh, the first one. There's two poems here. 
First one is Dusk or Untitled. Dusk or Untitled. From beneath the jacquard canopy of trees. I'm not sure what jacquard means. Jacquard canopy of trees. The sky arises duskily, pinkened with new chromo chromaticisms. Lush fountains, suburbs, blackberries, construction scaffolds, the pleasure of dresses from secondhand chain stores. You mustn't turn to the lights indoors to spoil the fun by turning the lights on in the house with the sun still on the horizon of summer's dog-legged meridian. This is not the kind of... Oops, hang on, let me get rid of that. This is not the kind of vesper, vesperal that hastens on the windowsill. I hear the radio in the other room mumble. The cruel work of summer hastens as we settle into our routine. Is there a rose in me worthy of these pirouette nights? Do not release the magic of tonight. Do not turn the lights on in the house. Hmm. Yeah. Um, well, let's see. So, Dusk or Untitled. I like a lot of the phrases. I'm curious about if some of them, what they are. There's words that I don't know. What's Jackard? Ah, Jackard is um, a type of fabric woven on a Jackard loom, a machine loom invented by the French tactile artisan Joseph Marie Jacquard in 1804. Um, fabrics woven with this type of loom feature complex patterns woven directly into the fabric. Ah, well, that's interesting. Okay. So I like that description too. And I like learning something. So thanks for teaching me that, Aaron. Dusk or Untitled. From beneath the jacquard, jacquard canopy of trees, the sky arises duskily. Uh, duskily is an interesting move. I, I like, um, you know, it's kind of bold to, to describe something as duskily. And I, I kind of like it. Pinkened with new... Uh, chromaticism. So chromaticism is a tough word. Um, I mean, I'm assuming chromaticism just means like color. I mean, what else would it mean? A composition. Oh, interesting. A compositional technique interspersing the primary diatonic pitches with chords and chords with other pitches of the chromatic scale. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. Chromaticisms. I like that. Yeah, okay. I, I mean, it made me look, but but I like it. Lush fountains, suburbs, blackberries, construction scaffolds, pleasure of dresses from secondhand chain stores. So really nice details here. We were talking about how other poems previously that we've seen today didn't didn't have those specific concrete details. Here we get a lot of it with the lush fountains, the suburbs, blackberries, construction scaffolds, the pleasures of dresses, not just dresses, but, you know, I mean, the difference between the pleasures of dresses or the pleasures of dresses from secondhand chain stores is huge i mean it's a really interesting detail you mustn't turn on the lights indoors to spoil the fun by turning the lights on in the house with the sun still on the horizon of summer's dog-legged meridian um and that's what would a dog-legged meridian mean summer's dog-legged a, a dog leg i mean i wouldn't like a dog leg is like sort of an l shape um like in golf for example the, you know, the game of sport of golf, the, a dog leg is where the fairway is like straight and then curves at the end. Um, so that's what I think of. So how is it a dog leg, Marianne? It's interesting, though. This is not the kind of vesperal. Vesperal? That's another word I don't know. And now, to me, um, pertaining to the evening or pertaining to the vespers. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. So to me, we have sort of, and this is one of the things that, um, you know, different magazines or publishers might have different feelings about because um, there's just different kinds of tastes. But we sort of have a feeling at Rattle where if you look up one or two words, it's great. But if you have to look up many words, it's just too much. <laughs> and I think, you know, t to me, I think having um, Jacquard, Chromaticisms, and Vesperal all in one poem um, is kind of a bit much to ask um, our typical reader. But maybe not necessarily, you know, it's some place that, has um you know readers with higher vocabularies that they're shooting for so it's just something to be aware of and um, that hastens on the windowsill i hear the radio in the other room mumble the cruel work and that's another word i don't know cruel work more embroidery terms cruel embroidery um there's another thing too about words you don't know um which is that um you know, like, for example, um, 
Robert Pinsky uses a lot of words I don't know. I mean, he's got a huge vocabulary, but he uses them within a context. Like if you look at a poem like, and it's only because of embroidery that I'm thinking about this. Um, but if you look at shirt, um, oops, sorry. Hang on one second. If you look up shirt by Robert Pinsky, um, the back, the yoke, the lardage, yardage, lap seams, like you don't, you sort of either, when there's these words you don't know, or it comes through a lot of words, we don't know really what they mean. The ringer, the mangle, and the needle, the union, the treadle, the bobbin. So I don't really know what the union is when it comes to, I assume it's not just a union, um, like a like a workers union. I think it's a part of a machine. I don't know what it is. You sort of don't need to, and you can just enjoy the words. Um, or the words are always, there's a context to it where you don't, you can sort of go back and look at later and be, have your experience of the poem be expanded by knowing what that more obscure word actually means. Like, I don't know what, I don't know what the ringer and the mangle are. I don't care though. I know that it's something to do with making a shirt because of the context of the poem. So I can just enjoy the sound. And then if I want to, I can look back later when I'm done with the poem and, um, and in, in my appreciation of the poem and understanding is deepened by knowing what those words actually mean later. Um, but within context, I don't need to. And so it doesn't block up the flow of the poem. Whereas if you look at this poem here, um, you know, the, this is not the kind of vesperal that hastens on the window cells. It really matters what vesperal means. Um, uh, let me see if there's another example. Um, let's see, the window, the window sill. I think toward the end, right? Isn't there a, isn't there another run? Well, I guess in this poem there's not, but but in other poems of his there there are, and you can look at it. There's always a lot of times it's, it comes within a list if they're really big words that you might not know. So you can sort of just within context of what else is on the list, you can get an imagine a sense of what it is, or it's just done in a way that you don't really need to know. Um, but if you need to know, it becomes kind of trouble. And, and, and vesperal is one of those like need to know kind of words within the context of that sentence. And so it stops the poem unless you know it already. And it could be that I'm, you know, bad <laughs> with vocabulary and don't and not as well read. Um, I do read too many poems. Um, so maybe it's, it's a common word for the target audience you want, and that's fine. But to me, it, it stops up the poem. This is not the kind of vesperal that hastens on the windowsill. I hear the radio in the other room mumble. The cruel work of summer hastens. And the cruel was something to do with embroidery. Um, the cruel work of summer hastens as we settle into our routine. So, so the picture that's being painted here um, is really beautiful. Comparing this, um, all, these, um, all these words for, um, for fabric and, and for weaving... Um, together into the sunset. The, the sky is this um, this fabric, and, and seeing the fabric of a sunset in that detail is really interesting. It works really well, but it's a little too obscured by the way the poem doesn't, you know, it assumes we know those words. And I think if you could make the tapestry, no pun intended, include more common things that we get a sense of it more, it would feel richer in the process, ironically, even though um, it's pretty dense as it is. Anyway... Um, I hear the radio in the other room kind of turn. I like that mumble. The cruel work of summer hastens as we settle into our routine and the we is introduced here. I think now there's a you here and I don't know who the you's and the we's are. So I get a little lost when I, when I come across those and, and an I is here too. You mustn't turn on the lights and doors to spoil the fun. And so is it, are you talking to me? Is it you general? Is it, you know, it's a little little confusing there. You know, we might work since we use we later. Um, we mustn't turn on the lights and doors to spoil the fun. Um, anyway, um, I hear the radio in the other room mumble. The cruel work of summer hastens as we settle into our routine. Is there a rose in me worthy of these pirouette nights? I think it's a great line. I like that. Do not release the magic of tonight. Do not turn the lights on in the house. Um, so, so, um, really vivid. There's a really, the, what works in this poem is the vividness of the descriptions. Uh, but I still have trouble connecting to it emotionally because it's, there's a distance with the, who we're talking to, who else is in this room? Um, you know, are you talking to, who are you talking to? Um, I think it's an important question. 
Um, let's see. <laughs> yeah. Morgan Finney says there's something melodic, though, about Vesperal, Windowsill, and the radio together, like they are here. There is something, and it's a matter of finding a way to um, to not make it hard to follow, you know? Um, let's see. Yeah, as Matt TC says, this is a good way to put it. The Pinsky poem plays with words within a clear context of shirts. The critiqued poem is more scattered in its references. Yeah. Um, uh, Brian O'Sullivan says, for in between cases where we kind of need to know, does a footnoted definition work? That's just, I would like the poem, you know, the poem to me, and maybe this is my opinion, um, but the, the poem... Um, needs to sort of be self-contained and that's really the issue if you have to break out to look at a dictionary or you have to look at a footnote you lose the magical because a poem is a magical spell it's casting this spell to conjure a an imaginary world to let the person enter and then experience something that's what a poem is really doing and when we sort of break the spell by leaving the poem whether it's leaving to a dictionary or leaving to a footnote so um, if there's like a key word that you need, maybe at the, get it in the epigram. I mean, I've seen a lot of poems where, um, you know, the, a word is defined in an epigram um, or epigraph. You could do that. Um, but I, don't know, I think it's just providing better context, um, even with the title, maybe, you know, Dusk or Untitled. And I don't know if that's actually the title or she's, you know, the author is suggesting maybe Dusk is the title or Untitled is the title, but maybe that can be set the scene in the way that Shirt does by Pinsky. You know, if you look at Shirt, we know everything is talking about shirts, the back, the yoke, the yardage, lap seams, the nearly invisible stitches along the collar turned in a sweatshop by Koreans or Malaysians gossiping over tea and noodles on their break or taking money or politics while one fitted this arm piece with its overseam. We know exactly what's going on the whole time. We're never lost, even though I don't know. And somebody said the mangle is a kind of machine. Pfft, beats the heck out of me. I've read the poem a thousand times. I never bothered to look it up. Um, and I could have, and my understanding would be expanded. But you don't need to to appreciate the sounds because you know the context the whole time. So many poems just lack the context to be able to let them be appreciated. I think that's maybe the theme of today. Um, but anyway, going back to this one. Um, so, so how could you do that? Um, how could you how could you work these beautiful words in? There's great lines. I love the descriptions of the sunset using those um, weaver, that language of the weaver. Um, you know, but what if you call the poem the language of the weaver? <laughs> and then we kind of get that feel, maybe. I mean, there's ways you can work it in like that where you get the context and then you never feel lost by the words you don't know. Um, let's see. Yeah. Um, so Deb T likes it. I think she says, because of the music and the images, I enjoy it without being absolutely sure of every word's meaning. I like it as is, except they changed the you line to something that didn't use the word you. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean maybe that's just um, the whole point um, that I've been making for the, most of this poem is maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just too much for me. Other people might not. You have to know your audience and care. Um you know, how you're trying to land with who. That's just a choice you make as a writer. Um, yeah. Um, Dismal Coffee says the last two lines could begin a very sensuous poem. See, I think there's a great poem in here um, that just lacks the, sort of the context and clarity to make it really great right now. Um, and, and the, the way that there's the I and the you and the we, and we don't really have a sense of who those characters are in the poem. And, um, and, and the, so I hear the radio, let me see, I hear the radio in the other room mumble, the cruel work of summer hastens as we settle into our routine. Is there a rose in me worthy of these pirouette nights? Do not release the magic of tonight. Do not turn the lights on in the house. Um, so, so this part starts to get the feel of a poem. Um, um, and, and, and then it kind of, the poem's just over. 
and I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to think of um, what advice I can give because I think there's a great, really, really good poem in here. It's just um, could use a little more context. Let me see what people are saying over on Facebook. Yeah, so jacquard is like on silk, same color but pattern to look like texture. That's interesting. Oh, I see. Okay, that makes more sense than the thanks, Tara. That makes more sense than the dictionary definition. Um. Okay. Carolina, Carolina says, I do think that sometimes we just need to break out a dictionary because we can't know the jargon that applies to every topic, but a poem should keep the jargon that applies to it. Yeah, I think th there's a way if you can, it's just a matter of building around. We mentioned scaffolding. You kind of need a scaffolding around because jargon words can be beautiful. Um, and, and often they are. And that detail is really wonderful. Um, but sort of there needs to be a scaffolding around it so we don't, um, you know, have to lose the sense of the poem every time we come across something we don't know. And it sort of is just lacking the scaffolding. And, um, and I think the latter half of the poem has more scaffolding, which is why I think it works better. Like the cruel work of summer hastens as we settle into our routine. I think it's a really nicely used work because it doesn't, you know, we get the sort of the, the texture of that cruel work without needing to know what it means. Like Vesperal, um, though, um, is defining the whole scene kind of in that, in that line. Um, anyway, okay, well, let's look at another poem. I'm, um, you know, I, I think, I think just working to smooth it out is the main thing with this one and, and, and adding some context. So it has, I think, you know, read some Pinsky poems as examples of how a lot of times there's a lot of jazz type poems where he talks about stuff. I don't really know what he's talking about. Um, he's got a lot of poems that does it, and he's just a great at doing that. It's a great example of how you can work. And it really makes the language feel beautiful and textured to have these words we don't know, as, as long as we have the scaffolding to follow along the poem anyway. Um, okay, let's move on to the next poem, though. Invisible. Recalling sweet blossoms only to awake in the sh dry shadow of the woman who was now her lady even though she was the one of royal blood, withering amongst wrinkled senescence, dreaming instead of robust thighs, lining the walls of her father's court. Waj de Shur Kennet and the fountains of Lapis Lazuli, between long forgotten that the letter M, as in mother, was once a pictogram for water. To be extra among the earth huts is slack and tan, what a waste was the she was beautiful in comparison without so much as trying to paint her face she would appear chem to them smothering black especially when on her knees on the dirt or in the marriage bed the future stretched out desolate in the desert too she sweated awake to alien dreams the god roy then the god who sees who came to her under a hedge moon in a starless sky, where she hid her dreams, behind a bush, blameless, broken, where she hid her son, too. Water. I want water. Hmm. Yeah. So Clayton says, um, lots of beauty in Dusk, or entitled, and I think the same thing applies here. There's lots of beauty in both of these poems. Um, the, the thing that's, that's, that's missing is just the consistency in that sort of scaffolding to the beauty where we can follow along i think in both cases invisible um let's look a little more closely at this one Re recalling sweet blossoms only to awake in the dry shadow of the woman who was now her lady um even though she was the one of royal blood hmm Withering amongst wrinkled senescence, dreaming instead of robust thighs, lining the walls of her. So I'm so, I mean, the, they're, I'm, it's hard to follow for me um, exactly what's going on. Like it's a lot to to sort of dump again in sort of an abstract way. Recalling sweet blossoms only to awake in the dry shadow. Like why is the shadow dry? Um, I mean, you know we get to the water later. Um, but, um, 
But how is a shadow dry of the woman who was now her lady, even though she was the one of royal blood? So in the dry shadow of the woman who was now her lady, and that was the one that had royal blood. So there's this whole sort of, you sort of have to like almost have one of those, um, you know, conspiracy theory maps with the pins to sort of detail all that out. Um, and I'm not sure, you know, it's just hard to follow that. Withering amongst wrinkled senescence. And senescence is like the, is aging, right? Isn't that, isn't that senescence like the study of aging, right? Condition or process of deterioration with age. Okay. So, so the wrinkled deterioration, dreaming instead of robust thighs, lining the walls of her. And so who is the her? I'm, I'm like holding all this in your head is a lot of mental capacity. Um, Tom Barlow says mummy. And yeah, I'm not really sure. And so there's nice lines here, but, but it's hard to sort of piece together and make them into sort of a mosaic. Father's court. So the father of the one with the royal blood, uh, you know, do you see how hard it is to kind of follow this once you really break it down? Um, Waj, Deshir, Kenet is more words to look up for me. Um, that is a amulet, a symbol of eternal youth, an ancient, Egypt, an ancient Egyptian amulet in the shape of a papyrus stem. Okay. Um, and the fountains of lapis lazuli, isn't that lapis lazuli? Is that blue, right? Um, yeah, it's that blue. Um, is it a rock? Yeah, it's a rock. Okay, but it, but it's like a blue dye. That's what you can make blue dye out of, and it was really rare. It, it, that's how I think. Been long forgotten. And then the, there's a sort of a um, um, a casual register to not having like the it's it's been long forgotten. Just been long forgotten. So we sort of shift register there too. That the letter M is in mother was once a pictogram for water. I love that fact. That's really fascinating. So are we in Egypt here? Um, I don't know. I mean, there's just a lot to piece together, even though it's interesting. Um, to be the extra among the earth huts in slack and tan, what a waste. She was beautiful in comparison without so much as trying to paint her face. She would appear chem to them. And it is chem... Um, I never say... Let's see. Is it, a Kemet is a chariot to heaven? And Kemeticism is the... Hmm. I am, so, okay. Um, chem to them, smothering black, especially when on her knees, in the dirt, or in the marriage bed. The future stretch out desolate, in the desert too. So so I think we're, we're talking about an Egyptian royal family. or You know, it's just hard to piece it all together. As beautiful as some of the words are. Um, the future stretched out desolate in the desert too. She sweated awake to alien dreams. And the alien seems, when I said earlier that the poem felt inconsistent, it was things like this, been long forgotten, which is a really informal way of saying that sentence. And then aliens appearing, where was that? Aliens appearing in this sort of ancient land um, to alien dreams, which seems a, a modern way of thinking about things. It was God Roy then, the God who sees, who came to her under a hedge moon in a starless sky, where she hid her dreams behind a bush, blameless, broken, where she hid her son too. So is that the story of um, Moses? Is this, um, who was the queen that found, or no, that put Moses in a, what was that story? Is that what we're talking about here? I think maybe, um, you know, a title more than invisible that can let us in a little bit more um yeah yeah so deb t says i'm lost and morgan finney said i like the m as a pictogram from uh for mother or a pictogram for water um deb t says one of the poet's questions was whether we need to know the subject and i think the answer is yes and we could as i was saying um by a title just just sets us in the place that would help a lot then if we knew who the she was, um, and who is the one, 
I'm thinking it's not Moses' story. Whose story is it that is there another story of a um of a princess who finds a baby? Because Moses is like the other way. Or no. I mean a princess who leaves a baby. I don't know. I don't know. I'm I'm kind of lost there too. So so we're just lost with this poem. We need we need to be let in, you know? Um, and a title can do that. And there's beautiful lines. It's just a matter of letting us in, not being obscure for obscurity's sake. I mean, we're, you're here to tell us a story. Debsy says, yes, Moses, but Moses, um, I, I'm really drawing a blank here <laughs> as far as um, what was Moses. Moses was found by the princess, right? So I, it doesn't make sense. Um, yeah. So anyway, so we feel a little too lost in the poem, but there's some beautiful lines in it. Yeah, Moses was in a river, not behind a bush. Yeah, good point, Morgan. Okay, so it's not that. So I don't really know what it is. So I don't know what the references are. Um, a lot of interesting details, though. But again, I mean, just look at, um, you know, we pulled up the Robert Pinsky as an example, but that kind of context is what's missing, a scaffolding to let us follow along, even as we don't know all the details. So we can we can enjoy the poem and learn at the same time. Um, and so telling us what's actually going on with the title can help. And then we'd know who the she is and where we are. And we wouldn't have to spend a lot of mental energy figuring that out. Okay, let's do one more poem before, because even though time is up, let's do one more poem now. Uh, once again, those are two really interesting poems by Aaron Sickler. Okay. Um, I just want to, this poem is uh, another Radoslav Stoyanov. Maybe we'll take a look. We already looked at that, so maybe we'll just. This was I just want to. Uh, this is a newer poem. Interesting. So this uh, originally written February twenty eighth, twenty twenty three. So it's five years after the last poem, apparently that we saw. Let's see uh, if anything's different now. I just want to. I wish I were brave to go for my dreams. I wish I were strong to fight for off my fears. I wish I were wise to avoid the extremes. I wish I were lucky to love without tears. So the same thing applies. We'll we'll just re reference back the other ref the other things. Abs it's you know we have to find the happy medium between the last poem by Aaron and the ones um, by Radoslav, who you know one's too vague, one's has too much detail without any kind of help along the way. Um, Um, yeah, and, and so it's a matter of like finding that the sort of the synergy between those two. Um, so anyway, and, 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 you know, tears again appears in this poem that is same. Remember I said the tears and fears rhyme is everywhere. Well, it's here in the same poem by the same poet five years apart. So, um, so we need more original language, more unique, interesting language, um, and more specific detail. Okay. Well, let's do another poem then since that was quick. And let's go to, um, next up we have James Langford. Hey, it's James Langford. I know him. <laughs> okay, tear at it. Tear it apart. Have at it. I can take it. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so this is Generations Wearing, and this is from, um, from May. So we're up to May 5th. That's good. It's a very short poem, which is good, too, since we're already past time. But we'll, we'll tear into it. Generations Wearing Christmas. This is our own James Langford. Generations wearing Christmas. Pajamas, barefoot winters sneak, then tiptoe into giggles. Pull one arm through the joy of giving. New sweater warm, her smile. Age wrapped my love to death, no card. I climbed into a tear. It fits. <laughs> yeah, oh, James Lankford says, uh oh. Now, this is interesting. So, generations wearing Christmas. Um, I'm not sure about the generations. I, I think maybe Wearing Christmas is a better title, but I like a lot of this poem. So pajamas, um, barefoot winters sneak, then tiptoe into giggles. Um, I don't know. That, I think the first couplet doesn't live up to the rest. Um, but I love pull one arm through the joy of giving. I mean, what a great line that is. New sweater warm, her smile. I like that too. I mean, these are like haiku. And I know there's a sort of joke. We turn everything to um, haiku, but those are great haiku. Pull one arm through the joy of giving. I think that's nice haiku. New sweater, warm, her smile. That's a nice haiku too. Age wrapped my love in death, no card. I like that too. Age wrapped my love in death, no card. I climbed into a tear. 
it fits. So as we mentioned with um, the last poet, uh, Radoslav, um, it, tears are always kind of melodramatic in poetry. And I think it feels a little bit that way too. So I'd maybe soften that and find a different way to say this. Um, and as Katie Dozier says exactly what I was about to say, um, she said I would shorten the line length. And exactly, I mean, it's one of those poems. Um, can I, I can't really, let me do, let me go like this. Hang on. We'll play with this poem a lot, James. Just give me a second. I'll get a, here, one second. We'll get, we'll get, splash up a document for you. Like this. And then like, okay. So now we have it in an editable document. Okay, so he, so James had it like this. And I think the, the best lines in the poem are, um, are, are the, the, these, these two here and these two. And maybe the death too is a little too melodramatic along with a tear. Maybe, maybe soften, you know, make, make those a little less strong so we can feel them more. You have to let the reader have room to feel kind of. Um, so I like... The idea, I like it just as wearing Christmas better than Generations. Or maybe without the, oops, maybe without the colon. Um, it just feels kind of stiff and formal having the Generations wearing Christmas. Whereas there's one line, maybe Generations wearing Christmas. I think I just like wearing Christmas better, though. Um, pajamas, barefoot winter sneak then tiptoe into giggles. Um, I, I'm confused about the, why there's apostrophe. Like, why is the winter possessing the sneak? Barefoot winter's sneak? Um, like, uh, to me, this is what I would do with a poem. Okay, so I would, I would just get rid of this and say, um, bare feet sneak then tiptoe into giggles. And and shortening these lines really helps too, as Katie Doger said. Pull one arm through the joy of giving. New sweater, warm, her smile. Um, to me, that's almost a very, it, it's a, it's a, a Sharon Ferrante S, Charita S. We can maybe even make it a Charita if we, if we, um, how does that go? Is it one, then two, then three lines? Or is it three, then two, then one lines for the Charita? But it could be a kind of form like that, a really tight, concise little poem. These really do work as haiku. Um, I think the poem had a little bit too much sort of otherness in it that didn't really work as well. Um, pajamas, barefoot, winter sneak, then tiptoe and giggles. I mean, the concept is good, but the, the wording is a little confusing there or a little just not as strong as it could be um that i wouldn't change a word of that that's great age wrapped my love what if it was instead of age see when i'm ta talking about softening things um is avoiding these like big pronouncements um like tears and death what if it was age unwrapped my love no card and then it, you let us feel that a little bit um I climb into a tear. It fits. So, so that, hmm. And I would just cut that. Um, and so what the generations did, oops, let me go back. What the generations did, and it was like this. Um, it set up the poem as a sort of structure where this is like um, the different, you know, the, the youngest one does this, the middle one does this the older one does this. Um, and, and I just think, I think it's sort of forced in that form a little too much. Um, and maybe, what if it was wearing Christmas over the years? Something like that instead. And then we, then that lets us play a little bit more and have a very set structure. I don't know. There's a lot of interesting ways you could work with this poem. Let me see what people are saying because I think others might have good ideas. Um, I 
Oh, Morgan Fee says, um, yes, might, might it be a tear as a rip instead of tear? That's one of those um, where you have to be cognizant of those strange quirks of the English language. There's no way um, that it works. Um, I mean, there's no way that you can resolve it just on the word alone uh, because it's a homophone. Um, yeah. Uh, so Charita is one is one three two three, but it can be inverted. Hmm. Yeah. And, yeah, and Gary Russell says inverted Charita three two one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but I think um, that's the kind of thing I would do is is to take these little lines and condense them into a form that really fits the poem instead of uh, to me, there was sort of an overarching idea on top of it. And then the poem sort of forced into that, whereas the poem really didn't end up being that exact form. And I like the progression of over the years, um, but having it be discrete stanzas like that wasn't really working uh, for me. Because it was just because the the first one mainly and the last one didn't really work at that length. So um, so so just play it with it more loosely, I think. Um, let's see. Um, yeah I mean to me I think I would I would just go minimal on the poem I think call it wearing Christmas um, and maybe not maybe maybe like this winter sneak then tiptoe when he giggles. Maybe no punctuation too, if you can use the like that. And then there, then it's very haiku-ish, like a haiku sequence, like what if we did that? And then it's like a haiku sequence, wearing Christmas, winter sneak, then tiptoe into giggles. I, mean, I like barefoot, bare feet better than winters. Bare feet sneak, then tiptoe into giggles. Pull one arm through the joy of giving. New sweater warm, her smile. Age unwrapped, my love, no card. So then it becomes a haiku sequence. I think a really nice one. I mean, I think that's probably what I do. But you keep playing in this way and sort of finding the right poem. Um... Hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know. Just play with it that way. Mary Picot says, I love the pajamas at the beginning. Um, maybe wearing pajamas is the title instead of Christmas. Hmm. Gary Rasson says, don't take out the last line. What was the last line? I climb into a tear. Yeah. Okay. Um... To me, the tear, I mean, that could be its own haiku, too. Hmm. Um, to me, the maybe it's because I had tears on the brain <laughs> when looking at the other poems. But to me, the, I thought of tear, and, and I think that ambiguity screws with the poem. Um, hmm. But if I only see it as tear, is there a way you could could get the tear in without that ambiguity? Hmm. Well, anyway, you see the kind of ways to play with this. Um, we've highlighted what was really what was really working and what wasn't. I think. Um, yeah. So so keep uh, keep playing with it along these lines. I think would be my suggestion here. That's just an idea. I'm not sure if we we got it the way we want it. Let me see if there's any other comments before we go. Hmm. Okay. Well, anyway, let's wrap it up. That is the critique of the week. Thanks, everybody, for participating. Uh, that was James Langford with uh, Generations Wearing Christmas. Um, let me... Uh, we had a whole bunch of good 
poems, though, and a lot of discussion. So thanks, everybody. Um, one important note, because I messed up last week or during during the Rattlecast on Monday, I said that this Monday's Rattlecast was the regular time, but it is not. Uh, this month, this Monday's Rattlecast is um, Remus Uzgiris um, is going to be the guest. And I, and I kind of got confused because Remus is sometimes in the U.S. and sometimes not. He's in Lithuania. And we'd, pr- we'd promised, <laughs> we'd, we'd scheduled it for um, 3 p.m. Eastern time, uh, not the regular time. So it's moved up five hours from the regular time because he, it's going to be like, I think, 10 p.m. there in Lithuania for him, which is, he's a night owl, so it's great, great timing for him and, and he you know, works during the day. So um, he likes that time, um, but, you know, f- 3 a.m. would be too late. So we're going to do uh, 3 p.m. Eastern time. 12 p.m. Pacific, noon for me here in the West Coast. But uh, Remus is a wonderful translator. Um, he's a Lithuanian-American who moved back to Lithuania um, and teaches there at a university, teaches translation. He's translated a whole bunch of Lithuanian poets. We'll have a few Lithuanian poets he's going to share with us. His most recent book is North of Paradise. He's going to share some new poems, too. He's been um, on the Rattlecast as part of the Poets Respond in the past. Um, but this time, it's going to be a full hour with Remus. That's going to be Rattlecast number 230. The prompt for this week uh, was to... Um, what was it? The prompt for this week was to write a poem that tells a story about a silent interaction with a stranger. So if you haven't had an interaction with a stranger yet, go out and do it. Dora, have an interaction online. That's an interesting idea, too. Um, but that's going to be your prompt and your guest, Rattlecast number 2.30, earlier than normal, though. Monday, January 29th, 3 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Or no, 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Pacific. Hope to see you there. Hope you have a great weekend, and I'll talk to you later. Goodbye. <laughs>